All right, here we are, James chapter 1. We'll begin reading together at verse 19. I'll read to verse 27. I'll take the whole portion of Scripture together that we'll be looking at. And then I'm going to take it apart, as I normally do, by going back to a couple of the verses we've already looked at to lay a foundation and then to move into our study. So beginning at verse 19, reading to verse 27, James chapter 1, James writes, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If, any, if anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. And so, as we're going through this, let me lay a foundation by reminding you of a couple things. James had just said that every good and every perfect gift came down from the Father. He said that in verse 17. He said, every good and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So he had just said that every good and every perfect gift comes from God. Now, included in these good and perfect gifts is the gift of eternal life. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Salvation is the gift of God. And so God has determined of his own will to save us. God determined to do that by himself. Nobody convinced him that sinful people should be saved, and we certainly don't deserve to be saved. Salvation is something that completely originated with him. And the Bible tells us that in John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So salvation originates with God. It was his pre plan, it was his determination to do that. And he chose to do, he planned to do this by sending his son Jesus Christ, who took upon himself the sin of the world. He became that perfect sacrifice. He's the one who made atonement for us. He satisfied God's um, uh, wrath uh, uh, over sin and all. He took it upon himself. And he was manifested, according to 1 John 3, verse 5, to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. So God determined to save us. He saves us by the sending of his son, Jesus Christ. And he uses the gospel to bring about our transformation. Verse 18 says, He of his own will brought us forth by the word of truth. So he used the gospel, the word of truth, in order that we might be born again. When he says he brought us forth, that's a word that means that he gave us new birth. And he made it possible for us to have new birth by the gospel, the word of truth. Now when you read your Bible, you're going to see that the word of truth speaks of the gospel. In Ephesians chapter 1, for example, verse 13, it says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. The word of truth is the gospel. He said, The gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. To Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, he said it like this. He said, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so the word of truth that saves us is also called the gospel. And so we got saved by depositing our faith in Christ, Jesus who was revealed to us in a message called the good news or the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's how we were born again. In 1 Peter 1.23 it says, Having been born again, 
not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So we were not saved by works of righteousness that we did. It's through the grace of God, salvation was provided, and the message of salvation is found in the gospel, which is also called the word of truth. And there was a purpose in that. We saw this in verse 18 last time we were together, and that is that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. So God brings us through a variety of trials, and we endure various temptations, even though we've been born again. God will bring us through these trials, and the enemy will tempt us, but this is intended to perform a work in us. Because we need to remember that in the midst of these trials, and he's been speaking of trials, in the midst of these trials, we can have various responses. He'd already said in verse 13 of chapter 1, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. We can have various responses, and this is what James is about to address, to the, uh, the trials that we find ourselves in and through the enduring of the temptations that the enemy places before us. Uh, we can become angry. Uh, we can become frustrated. We can start to blame God for these things. We might even be attracted to the temptations and even give in to them. So James is instructing us, how do you deal with these things when you encounter them? Well, he begins by telling us in verse 19, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. So he's saying this is how you deal with them. Be swift to hear. Now, be swift to hear what? What is it I'm supposed to listen to? He says, therefore, be swift to hear. Swift to hear what? He's, well, swift to hear good counsel. Swift to hear solid teaching on how to deal with the trials that you're going through. You see, a lot of people will not listen to advice. In Proverbs 12, 15, it says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But a wise man listens to advice. Well, there are quite a number of people who are, are not swift to hear. They're not willing to receive counsel. They're, they're not able to be uh, not only confronted, but even comforted. Because what they're doing is fine with them. But the Proverbs tells us in chapter 19, verse 20, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. It's especially important that we should be swift to hear the word of truth. And when we receive counsel, it's always best if that counsel is uh, in Scripture, is found in Scripture. In Psalm 119, there's a fly here that I'm going to grab if I can. Please don't be distracted. I'm going to pull out my sword and take his wings off. Psalm 119, 133 says, direct, direct my steps by your word. Let no iniquity have dominion over me. Counsel is important to receive, especially if it's scriptural. <laughs> that fly's bugging me. He's right here. If I kill him, please don't be mad at me. In Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, let me develop this with you. The psalmist in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, gives us counsel that I think is really important for us to listen to. In Psalm 1, he says it like this, verse 1 through 3, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Again, it is not wise to receive counsel from those who don't know the Lord. And the psalmist actually says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. Be very careful who you allow to give you counsel. Be very careful who you go to for advice. Uh, it, there's so many <laughs> methods in social media today to you put out your problem, and before you know it, you'll get a ton of people writing, giving you advice. You know, I'll look at Facebook. I use it for ministry. 
And I'll look at it. You can see it in the other forms of social media. And somebody will say something, and before you know it, you got 14, 15 responses of people giving advice. And sometimes the advice that's being given is just unwise. And yet people feel so free to give advice. And so the psalmist says, be very careful that you don't walk in the counsel of the wicked, that you don't stand in the way of sinners, and nor do you sit in the seat of scoffers. He says his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he medita meditates day and night. So when you receive counsel, be careful not to receive advice from those who don't love the Lord and don't care that much about you. In times of trial, very often the godly disciplines we've cultivated begin to be neglected. Under pressure, we can become sidetracked, and when we become sidetracked, we begin to lose focus. And that can lead to us drifting away from the Lord. It can also begin a backslide. And the fruit that results from backsliding will be reaping what a person has sown. In Proverbs 14, verse 14, it says, The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. So be very careful that you stay close to the word of God. So be swift to hear. Be swift to hear what the Lord has to say. Be swift to hear when you're reading the word. I, I pray you read your Bibles every day, that you pick it up and go through it. There are various programs you can, you can actually be involved in that, that reading certain passages, certain amount of chapters in a day. Uh, you can read the whole Bible in a year. A lot of people say, well, I don't like to read the Bible. Well, th the problem with that is you're getting your advice from the world. You need to pick it up and read it. If you can't read very well, or perhaps you can't read at all, there are, there are different things. You can get uh, the Bible read. You can have the Bible read to you, various uh, CDs and, 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 and things like that. But you need to be in the Word of God. And you need to be swift to hear what God has to say. Listen, you've received God's gift of life. You've received His Word, James would be saying, so be swift to hear it. Be quick to receive His instruction. Be quick to hear His counsel and correction. That comes to the Bible. If you're going through trials, if you're going through temptations, be quick to hear what God is saying. And instead of blaming, open your ears and your heart and listen to what he has to say. Listen to the instructions you find in the word of truth and practice them. And, and this is going to come again through being taught by your personal Bible reading and, and praying for wisdom. Remember in verse 5 of chapter 1 here, he said, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, it will be given to him. Well, you'll receive this from the Lord. And it should be a daily habit, a daily habit of fellowship with the Lord in word and in prayer. Like it says in Psalm 25, verse 4, show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. So be quick to hear. Then he says, be slow to speak. Now that's important because when we're in a trial, it's easy to speak without thinking. Sometimes we, we may receive counsel that we disagree with, and our response, especially when we're under pressure, may be to become angry, and we may lash out at the one who's speaking to us. We need to be slow to speak against what we hear. We need to listen and consider what is being said. One of the things over time I've learned to do, and I encourage you to do the same if you haven't already, is I've learned to, to listen before I make my judgments. When I was younger, if you said something to me I didn't agree with, I, I was prone to want to argue immediately. I wouldn't even listen to you. I wouldn't even weigh out what you were saying. I would just think, what do you know? Who are you? I, you know, and that was my attitude for the first few years of my Christian walk. Because I came out of the world, and in the world you argue, and there's nothing wrong with it, and that's what I did. And then I got married, and I learned to shut up. What I actually had to learn is to listen. You have to listen, not because you're afraid, by the way, because I wasn't afraid. Not that, not that afraid. <laughs> but because I want to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying. And I came to realize that this is some practical advice that I'm giving to you about being quick to hear. I came to realize something that I didn't realize, and this is practical. I hope it works for you. I came to realize in my case that when my wife had a correction to bring to me, she was doing it because she loved me. My first response for many of the early years was she's trying to dominate me, and I, I just didn't have a, a, I'm not that kind of man that you can dominate. I'm just not. Didn't like it, don't like it. 
So don't, 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 don't tell me what to do was my attitude. Don't tell me what to do. I'll, I'll do what I want to do. If you don't like it, it's too bad. That was my attitude. None of you guys are like that. I realize that. I'm just, I'm just the sinner up here just being real. But the Spirit of the Lord said to me, she loves you. She loves you. And how did the Spirit of the Lord say that to me? I was reading my Bible. Husbands, love your wife. Husbands, you know, uh, cover them with the word of God and prayer. And, this. and I'm reading about husbands, and I'm starting to see about wives. And I'm realizing that she gave everything up to be married to me. She didn't have to do that. She chose to do that. She did that because she loved me. I came to realize that. I actually came to accept her love because I wouldn't do it at first. I was kind of like hands off and all of that in our early days. And when I finally came to realize that this was a woman who loved me and the reason she would bring a word to me that sometimes I needed a correction is because she loved me. And when I began to see that, what I learned to do is this. I learned to listen and not to speak. And I would walk out after she'd say whatever. And it's always mild. It's not something heavy or whatever. It was just like blah, blah. And, and I just, mm, I don't see that. And I'd go and think about it. And I'd pray about it. And I'd, I'd think, you know, Lord, that's true. I am that way. And I have never seen that about myself, but she sees it clearly as an outside person looking at me. And that's what I began to do. But guess what? James says, be, be slow to speak and be quick to hear. And that's, that's how it works in a practical way. And when, when, when I'm being convicted, and sometimes in, when the word's being taught or whatever and I'm convicted, I could quickly speak. I don't agree with that. Well, what do you know about that? But that, that's why you meditate on it. That's why you think about it. That's why you cross-reference the scripture. That's why you get to know your Bibles. So you can be able to do something like that. And, and you learn to consider what's being said. You see, today Christians speak loudly and quickly. And sometimes they're, they're real quick to speak about what they're going through. Again, Facebook. All you got to do is open it up. And people say, I'm doing this and I'm going through that. And they speak about everything. And they think that all of these names on their friend list are really friends. And they're not. I've got 5,000, 10,000 actually people and friends. They're not my friends. <laughs> well, a friend is a friend is somebody you sit down and have coffee with. It's a friend that you go out and have a meal with. A friend that you, you talk about life with. You, you talk about family. You talk about plans and things. You take vacation. Those are your friends. The people on Facebook, I'm not saying they're bad people. Some of you may be my friends on Facebook. You're my connections. You know, I'll talk to you and all. But until we get to know each other on a face-to-face -face thing, you wouldn't really say, oh, that's my buddy Dave. You wouldn't say that. Better not. Because <laughs> we're not friends. That's just a word we throw around, right? You're a real friend is somebody that you know, somebody you spend time with, somebody that you go out for meals with, somebody that you share your heart with, somebody that can correct you. Uh, a real friend is somebody who puts his shoulder next to yours and you look in the same direction. That's a friend. You're moving to together in the same direction, right? And so when you have a friend, somebody who can speak to you and they share with you, they're taking a chance of losing you. And I had to learn that because my wife, when she would speak to me, had to learn how to address the issue that she had. She wouldn't be unwise to just challenge me because I talk for a living. And so I can argue. And I can use scripture as I, as I desire. She had to learn how to lovingly correct me. And James had to be believed by me. So when he said for me, be slow to speak, and to be quick to hear, that changed my life. Because instead of always arguing my point, I had to learn that somebody else may have one that's just as valid or will give to me insight that I'm not picking up on on my own. And in the Christian life, I simply need to be wise enough to receive correction and uh, education from a fellow believer. I don't want to be brainwashed or hoodwinked, if you will, by a non-believer, so I'm careful to stay within Scripture guidelines and to look for scriptural truth and to be careful that I'm not just spilling out my guts about things I'm going through because today, complaining openly is often seen as being real, being transparent. Some people will say, well, I just have to say what I'm feeling and if I'm feeling it, why shouldn't I say it? Well, remember Proverbs 29, 11. I'll give you a moment to write this down. Proverbs 29, 11. 
A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. That's good advice, don't you think? Have there ever been a time when you opened your big mouth and wish you hadn't? <laughs> I, I do every Sunday, you know. It's just learning not to vent constantly. Listen to what Scripture says about being slow to speak. Proverbs 10, 19. In the multitude of words, there lacks not sin. But he that refrains his lips is wise. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. Proverbs 21, 23. Whoever guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. Somebody once said, men have two ears, but only one tongue, that they should hear more than they speak. So Psalm 141.3 says this, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. And, I, and I, I will say this briefly and then move on. It's a wise thing to learn this. There are times that I'm having conversations with people and they're saying things that, that really need correction, but I wait and I hear them out. I want to hear what they have to say. And then I seek the Lord for ways to gently and lovingly give a word of correction in that so that they might have what the biblical view would be. And somebody says, well, what gives you the right to do that in the first place? Well, I'm a pastor. That has something to do with it. I've been walking with the Lord almost 49 years. That has something to do with it. I've been teaching the Bible for 46 years. That has something to do with it. I figure that I've studied the Word of God something like 48,000 hours over the course of my life. That has something to do with it. I've taught over eight, 9,000 Bible studies in my life. I think that has something to do with it. So if I share something with somebody, it may be founded in experience in Scripture. There's a good chance that what I'll be sharing with you is found there. But that doesn't mean that I have to just talk. I want to hear. I want to hear what you're saying. I want to hear your heart. And that's what you ought to do too. That's what James is teaching believers in general. My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. When undergoing a trial, we can lash out in anger and reject reading the word of God. And because of this, we're not going to receive the comfort of the Lord because we quench his Holy Spirit. In Proverbs 14, 29, the writer said, he was slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. In Proverbs 16, 32, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. It, it takes a calm spirit to receive and appreciate instruction and direction. And anger has a way of quenching that spirit and provoking us to reject the comfort God has for us. As a matter of fact, notice what he says in verse 20, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. It's been said angry preachers and angry Christians are truly bad witnesses for Jesus. Angry and vengeful people stir up strife and they destroy rather than bring in healing. Proverbs 29, 22, an angry man stirs up dissension. A hot-tempered one commits many sins. And in our day, this rings even more loudly. There are so many angry Christians. They're afraid of what they're seeing take place, and they're voicing their concerns with anger. And for them, it seems that all they see are problems, and they don't see possibilities of what God can do. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful that we listen and that we, that we are slow to speak. We're slow to get angry because the fact is angry people don't produce God's righteousness. People don't get attracted to the God of mercy and love when his people are always mad at other people. Well, it says in verse 21, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now, when he says lay aside, the words lay aside means to willingly remove. The word filthiness speaks of moral impurity. The word wickedness speaks of depravity. He's saying lay aside, willingly remove this moral impurity and your depravity 
And that's something that is similar to what we saw in Colossians in chapter 3 when Paul spoke of the things that identify the lives of unbelievers. He spoke of fornication and uncleanness. He spoke of passion and evil desire. He spoke of covetousness and anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy language. These are things to be laid aside. So James is saying something similar. He says, remove anything that keeps you from pursuing the Lord. And then he goes on in verse 21 and he says, Receive with meekness the implanted, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. It's like our hearts are soil. And so we welcome God's word into our heart. And God's word is the seed that we by faith receive with humility. Now, not all people are willing to receive the word of God into their hearts. Even in church services, Bible studies can be given. The word is rightly divided, but there's still a heart of rejection. Don't want to hear it. They don't want to know that. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 10 says it like this. To whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed so that they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. There are quite a number of people who say, oh, I want to serve the Lord. But when God's word is given to them, they don't want to hear it. My mother was sharing with me on one occasion. My mom was quite the little evangelist. She loved to share the love of Christ with people. And she said that she was sharing with a woman about Jesus. And, and as she was sharing with this woman, she said to the lady, would you like to receive Christ? And the woman said, of course I would. And my mom said, would you pray with me? And the woman said to my mother, yeah, I'll pray with you. So my mom began, Father, forgive me a sinner. And my mom said, Dave, she said, the moment I said, Father, forgive me a sinner, that woman got upset. She said, I'm not a sinner. And there are quite a number of people who believe that they're really not that bad, right? Really not that bad. Well, Jeremiah said something about that. To whom can I speak and give warning? Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed so that they cannot hear. The word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. You know this is true. If you share the word with somebody who doesn't know Christ, they don't always just welcome it. They don't always say, oh, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. You're right, I am a sinner. No, they don't. They're going to argue with you or get upset or get offended. You know, maybe they'll, they'll go to their safe space Get one of their little ponies and hold it. I don't know. They get upset. They don't want to hear. They get mad because you offended them. How dare you say that to me? In Romans 8, 7 and 8, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So then those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. See, God's word is to be received with faith and humility. Why? Because he said, it saves your soul. Receive the engrafted word of God, which is able to save you. Jeremiah 31, 33 said, This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts, and I will be their God. They shall be my people. And so he says, receive it. It's able to save you. But he moves on into application, verse 22 but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Have a heart to receive. Have a heart to understand. Openly identify with God's word and obey him. That identifies you as a genuine Christian. In 1 John 2 verse 3, by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So James is saying that it's not enough to simply agree with what we hear. In order for us to understand and experience the presence of the Lord and his blessings, we're not only to hear, but we're also to do. James says you can actually deceive yourself. You can deceive yourself by thinking that all you need to do is listen, but not act. There are quite a number of people, I'm sad to say, but it's true, who are like that today. Quite a number. In Matthew chapter 7, why don't you turn with me? I, I have it here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn you there. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Somebody says, where is Matthew? He's in heaven, but his book is the first New Testament. In Matthew chapter 7, I want to read to you. I had a, a verse I was going to quote, but I'm going to read more. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. 
We'll look at verse 21. And notice this, please. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Did you notice that? Not everyone who says, but he who does. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on the house, it didn't fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. James, back in James, is saying, don't be just hearers, be doers of the word. It's not enough that I'm able to repeat a scripture, I need to practice it. I need to do what the scripture says. And I can deceive myself by thinking that all I need to do is listen, but I shouldn't have to do anything. He says to us in, uh, in Luke 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I say? Why do you say that you're mine when in fact you don't obey me? You don't do what's being said. I think if there's anything we, the church today needs to remember is that obedience is better than sacrifice. That God wants us and has commanded us, and he didn't give us the ten suggestions. He gave us the commandments because he intends for us to obey him. And one of the ways that I demonstrate that I love him is through obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John in 1 John tells us that his commandments are not burdensome. In other words, for a believer to obey the things that God gives to us in his word gives us great pleasure and demonstrates that we love him. Instead of being thinking that, that, that God's word is, is just ruining my day and ruining my fun, I ought to see it as something that is saving me and, and building my life up. And he's making it very clear because back in James, he makes it clear in this way. He says in verse 23, if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. So this is a guy who's getting ready to go out. He stands in front of a, of a mirror, if you will, and he looks at himself, walks out, and within 10 minutes he's thinking, oh, did I shave? I wonder if, is there anything on my tooth, you know? I, I've, I've, they'll do that. We can, we can do that. You get ready, but your mind's on something else. You're standing in front of the mirror. You walk out of the room and you say, did, did I put on my, my pants? You, 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 ask yourself, you ask yourself these things. I've been driving, so have you sometimes, and I'll, I'll pull up behind somebody. There'll be a lady, and she'll be putting her makeup on while she's driving, and you'll see her pull her mirror down like that. She's making sure her... Her, her makeup's on, and I get a little nervous. I get nervous. I get more nervous when it's a guy, but that's a different, <laughs> that's a different subject. <laughs> but because her eyes are, are, are not on the road, but they're also going to forget because they'll pull it down and look again, pull it down and look again. That's what he's saying. A, a person who's not doing the word is constantly only glancing at it, but not being changed by it. Nothing's changed. He says, if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. He observes himself, goes away, immediately forgets what kind of man he was. He's not actually seeing himself for who he is. See, the word is a mirror. It reveals to me who I actually am. But if I only glance at it and don't really take a deep look in it, there's no change that's going to take place. But he says in verse 25, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. So when he says he who looks into it, that word looks is a deep and attentive consideration that is given to something. It's not just a glance. When you look into the perfect law of liberty, 
we understand that God's grace is revealed to us and we have freedom in him. We're freed from guilt. We're freed from the power of sin. We're freed from its control. And this is a perfect law because it needs nothing added to make it complete. Notice how he says, and continues in it. And is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. Nothing moves you away from the hope that's found in the gospel. You're not carried away by bad doctrine. You stand fast in the faith that's revealed in it. You're not a forgetful hearer. You're a doer of the work. In other words, you serve the Lord and you're blessed. You're not forgetful. The word forgetful speaks of the one who studies and forgets what he studied. Doesn't grow. I wonder how many of you in school did what I did for a while in school, which is to cram the exams the next day so you stay up late at night preparing for it. But you're not learning anything. You're only preparing for the next day. So I would take my test. I was with the hopes of passing it. But I forgot everything because I was cramming. I wasn't taking my time. Then I discovered in classes, if I actually took my time, took my notes, read the material, read the lectures that I had, that I had been uh, transcribing, spent time thinking it through, I'd do good in my test. But that required a lot of work. There are a lot of people who cram their spiritual life, cram for a spiritual life. They kind of hear a Bible study once, they listen, listen, maybe they listen to two studies in a row. They're cramming, but they're not spending time in the Word. And so what we need to do is we need to understand that maturity comes through developing a habitual practice. In John 13, 17, Jesus said it like this, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And finally, he goes on and he says in verse 26, if anyone among you thinks he's religious and doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. If anyone thinks he's religious, that word religious is a word that actually speaks of trembling, fearing. It speaks of a worshiper of God. Somebody who's religious is, is known as a religious person because they pray or maybe they preach, they give, some other action. Religion itself is not being condemned. It's the hypocritical practice associated with it. There are a lot of people who say, you know, religion, religion. And, and my generation, we began to say that. I'm not religious, I'm a Christian. Well, there is a, there is a true religion, and James points that out. Pure and undefiled religion. There is such a thing. And we need to remember that Jesus himself was a, 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 a lifetime observant Jew uh, of his Jewish faith. What Jesus condemned was hypocrisy. The hypocrisy associated with outward uh, observation only. And James is saying that authentic Christianity produces something. It produces love. It produces fellowship. It produces purity. I'll take a moment to share something with you and develop this a little bit. When your society that you live in is evil, there will always be more laws passed to govern people. The more the law, the greater the awareness of evil. That's what laws are intended to do, right? Laws are intended to stop evil. And so the more the law, the more evil that is in that society. But laws do not transform hearts. They can penalize behavior. And I'll probably get in trouble for saying this. This isn't in my notes. You can't pass a law to make me love anybody. I think that the laws that are passed, anti-discrimination laws and all, are intended to restrict evil behavior towards somebody. But you cannot pass a law that makes me love somebody. What you can pass a law is pass in a law is something that penalizes me for violating what that law states. Now I think we all agree with that. That's what laws do. If it says drive 55 and I go 65, I've, I'm penalized because I broke the law. 
If it says I cannot say a certain thing because it's a hateful thing, I can be penalized because somebody determined what hate is. And so I'm going to be penalized for certain things, but it can't change my heart. You can pass a law if you'd like that tells me to love somebody. I don't have to love them. I, and I'll probably not because your law told me to. Something else has to happen before I will do that, which the law with good intent supposedly is being passed for me. I'll give you another one. This will get somebody mad, at least one of you. So we see people being shot, and now we have people rushing to say, take all these weapons from people, that'll stop them. And that's just not true. Because if you take somebody's gun, then he'll use a billy club. If you take the club, he'll use a knife. If you take away the knife, he'll use a rock. That's what you do when murder's in your heart, is you find a way to kill. I'm not saying that's good, by the way. I'm saying that is. Because we have these laws that everybody's running and jumping on, get rid of the you know, AKs, get rid of the ARs, and these, they're calling it assault weapons and this and that. They're saying get rid of all of these things, and, and that's going to stop killing. No, the majority of killings with weapons are with handguns. Not with ARs and not with AKs. They're handguns. So this is a knee-jerk reaction. And they're forgetting something. And I'm going to get you mad, some of you. Here you go. Ready? <laughs> I have weapons. I have weapons at my home. I have a uh, Smith & Wesson 40. I have an AK. I have an AR. I've got a shotgun that will kill an elephant. But I haven't killed any lately. They're not in my neighborhood anymore. <laughs> they have never come off the shelf and shot anybody. They never have. They just sit there. Why? Because they don't have a will of their own. In order for them to be used in that way, someone's got to pick it up and use it. So when, <laughs> so when you're telling me that I don't have the right, now my God, this people, I, forget, I know someone's going to get mad at me. Write to, write to David Bustamante at <laughs> calvarycc.org. Let him know. He'll tell me on Tuesday. I believe the change is not through a law. The change comes through love. And the change comes when the church awakens to preaching the gospel that transforms evil hearts. And what God has called us to do is preach the gospel. And that's what we do. That's what we do. And I might as well, I dug the hole. Here we go, one more. And this is just a fact. This is a fact. I pray to God this never, ever happens. I pray to God this never, ever happens. But if somebody broke into my home to hurt my wife, I will protect my wife to my death. And, and I will. That's what men do. That's what men do. We take care of our families. That's what men do. That's what God created us to do. And I will do it. I will do it not because I want to. I will do it because I have to. I have to take care of her. Greater love has no man than this to lay down his life for his friend. And I will lay my life down for my wife. And if someone broke in my house, i do good funerals. Because I'll give him one. I'll give him one. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Hate me. I know there's at least one hater in here. There's got to be. So what do we do? So what do we do? The laws that people are championing right now are only to try and... I'm just being real. Forgive me if you think preachers shouldn't say this. But I, I, I think it's true. I'm going to tell you what I believe is true. Forgive me. But it's championing a cause. But the bottom line is we Christians are supposed to be out there as salt and light. N no, I'm not saying run around and and get ready. No, I'm not saying we should be militant and use 
guns. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that when you tell me that your law is going to change human behavior as a Christian, I have to differ with you. I have to disagree with you because the law only restricts. It does not transform. The law does not make me love you. Now, the Bible tells me to love people, and I believe in Christ. I believe in, in Jesus, in, in the Lord, that I do, that it doesn't matter to me. If, if you want to call yourself by whatever, whatever hyphenated name you want to use today, whether it be Mexican-American, African-American, Asian-American, Native American, doesn't matter to me. You're a human being, and as a human being, I love you, not because you're black or yellow or brown or, or red or, or white. It doesn't matter to me. I love you because Christ loved me, and he taught me to love you. And because I love you, I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to kill you. But don't try and hurt my wife. <laughs> because at that point, my two friends, Smith and Weston, will want to talk to you. And they talk loudly. So I'm using a little humor, but trying to make a point. The evil, more evil the society, the more the laws. That's how it works. So when God works in us, God says, love one another. And love does no harm to a neighbor. Because love is the fulfillment of the law, Romans 13.10. And so what changes society is not laws, laws, laws. It's God's love, love, love. And that's why I, as a pastor, feel very strong about continuing to preach the transformation of human life through the faith of Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why I do what I do, because I can tell you, don't do this and do that, but I can also say, guess what? God loves you. God forgives you. God changes lives. God can change yours. God gives you power in the Holy Spirit. He gives you direction through his word. He can take you. You were a drunk. He can change you. You were, you were a drug addict. He can change you. You were a fornicator. You were an adulterer. You were a liar, a thief. You were a killer. God can forgive you. That's what the gospel does. And that's how it works. And that's why we do what we do. So society is evil. Yes, it is. But more laws will not change human hearts. Love is to govern the way we speak to and speak about one another. So pure and undefiled religion before God is love and purity. First is to visit. The word visit speaks of caring for or looking after, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. So that speaks of our duty towards others. Widows and orphans were considered amongst the most vulnerable in society. They had no husband. They had no father to provide to protect, to care for them. And so in the early church, widows who were in good standing were well cared for, and that was what the church was to do. We also care for the orphans, and we do what we can. As a church, we've always done that. And, and I should say this very quickly, that caring for the widows, our fellowship has done for many, for many years, and, and, and we want to care for the, the fatherless children and so our men's ministry is preparing a ministry right now called Stepping Up. And it's a ministry that will disciple and mentor young men or young boys who come from families where the father is not present or the father has passed away. And this ministry is designed to instruct the things of the Lord to these boys, these young men, to help them to become godly men and to be leaders in the church. We want to do it. It's kind of like a big brother's thing where some of the men, godly men, who've been vetted will help and care for some of the kids who would like to have a guy to go fishing with or to spend some time with. And I believe we should do that. I believe we should help. And that's what we want to do. What is pure and undefiled religion but to care for the widows, care for the orphans, and he says, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world? We're to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with Jesus Christ, according to 2 Peter 3.14. So his point is simple. Loving holy lives demonstrates that you truly know the Lord. Loving the Lord is going to produce a holiness in your life and a care for other people. It's going to be demonstrated by your love for the Lord, even though you're going through a trial. It's going to be demonstrated that you, you don't blame God for the things that sometimes you brought on yourself. 
It simply means that we know who he is and we ask God to work within us as we determine to follow him, that our lives would be changed, that we could bring glory to him. It's called Christianity. It's called loving Jesus with everything. And that's what James is telling us to do. He's saying, be a doer of the word, not just a hearer. Don't deceive yourself. Don't deceive yourself. Do what he says and watch what God does in your life. I've been attempting to do that now for a long time and my life has been transformed because his word and his spirit makes you brand new. Makes you brand new.